Hello, boys and girls. This is Brother Torrance coming to you. Um, let us prepare for our Saturday night Bible chat, um, Bible class. If you could, before we get started, do me one favor and grab your Bibles, please, before we get started. All right, I'm going to open up in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Most Gracious Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come to you again. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to come before you, Heavenly Father, to seek your name, to seek your word, and hear your word, Heavenly Father, as you undertake for the message. That the young people will hear this word, the Heavenly Father, hide in their, in their hearts, the Heavenly Father. That's it, Tiana, take for COVID 19. Um, virtual school learning for those that's the virtual learning, the Heavenly Father. Undertake for the teachers, undertake for the kids, undertake for the parents. Just undertake for the stresses of being home, the Heavenly Father, and not being able to go out and be with their friends and interact with their friends. So that's it, take for the curriculum that the teachers are teaching. Give them strength and wisdom and boldness and salvation, Lord, for the lost and spiritual growth for the saved. The Lord has to continue to take for. The social unrest is going on. Undertake for the things that we need to be aware of, the Heavenly Father, the things that we can't see, the things that's unseen. And Lord, as you continue to take for the families, the Heavenly Father, we press forward. And Lord, as you give us um, wisdom, Lord, as we approach each day, the Heavenly Father, as you undertake for the word today, the Heavenly Father. We just want to thank you for all that you've done, all that you're going to do, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Praise the Lord, saints, and the youth at ALDM. Welcome back to another Saturday night Bible class. My name is Sister Liz. I will be going over the books of the Bible with you. We're going to start off by reciting the New Testament books of the Bible, and then we're going to jump into what the lesson of today is, which is the book of 1 Thessalonians. So I hope you enjoy it, and I will have the video uh, URL at the end of this clip if you care to watch it in full length on YouTube. Thanks, guys, and we hope you and pray that you enjoy it. Praise the Lord, and you guys have a blessed week. Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. This is most likely the earliest letter that we have from Paul, and the backstory for it is found in the book of Acts. It's where Paul and his co-worker Silas went to the ancient Greek city of Thessalonica. And after just one month of telling people the good news about Jesus, a large number of Jewish and Greek people gave their allegiance to Jesus, and they formed the first church community there. But trouble was brewing. Paul's announcement of the risen Jesus as the true Lord of the world, it led to suspicion. So the Christians in Thessalonica were eventually accused of defying Caesar, the Roman emperor, when they said that there is another king, Jesus. And this led to a persecution that got so intense, Paul and Silas actually had to flee from the city. And this was painful for them because they loved the people there so much. And so this letter is Paul's attempt to reconnect with the Christians in Thessalonica after he got a report from Timothy that they were doing more than okay, they were flourishing despite this intense persecution. Paul opens by giving thanks and celebrating the Thessalonians' faith, their love for others, and their hope in Jesus despite persecution. He goes on to retell the story of their conversion, how they used to be idolatrous polytheists, and they were living in a culture where all of life was permeated by institutions and practices that honored the Greek and Roman gods. And Paul talks about how they turned away from those idols to serve the living and true God, and that they're now waiting for the coming of God's Son from heaven. So in a city like Thessalonica, transferring your allegiance to the creator God of Israel and to King Jesus, this came at a cost. Isolation from your neighbors, hostility from your family. But for the Thessalonians, the overwhelming love of Jesus who died for them and the hope of his return, it made it all worth it.
Paul then retells the story of his mission in Thessalonica and of the dear friendships he formed with the people. He uses really intimate metaphors here. They treated him like their child, and he became like their mother and like their father. He says, We were happy to share with you not only the good news from God, but our very selves, because we came to dearly love you. Paul reminds us here that the essence of Christian leadership is not about power and having influence. It's about healthy relationships and humble, loving service. He reminds them that he never asked for money. He simply came to love and serve them in the name of Jesus. And so Paul moves on to reflect on their common persecution. Just like Jesus was rejected and killed by his own people, so now Paul is persecuted by his fellow Jews and the Thessalonians are facing hostility from their Greek neighbors. And Paul draws a strange comfort from knowing that together their sufferings are a way of participating in Jesus' own life and death. Paul then shares about the anguish he experienced when he heard of the hardships the Thessalonians had after he and Silas fled. So he sent Timothy to support them and see how they were doing. And to his joy, Timothy discovered that they were going strong. They were faithful to Jesus. They were full of love for God and their neighbors. And they longed to see Paul as much as he longed to see them. And so Paul concludes with a prayer for endurance. And what's cool is that he introduces here the topics he's going to address in the letter's second half. He prays that God will grow their capacity to love, that he'll strengthen their commitment to holiness as they fix their hope on the return of King Jesus. So he opens the letter's second movement by challenging them to a life that's consistent with the teachings of Jesus. So this means, first of all, a serious commitment to holiness and sexual purity. In contrast to the promiscuous, sexually destructive culture around them, they are to follow Jesus' teaching about experiencing the beauty and the power of sex within the haven of a committed marriage covenant relationship. God takes sexual misbehavior seriously, Paul says. It dishonors and destroys people and their dignity. Following Jesus also means a commitment to loving and serving others. So Paul instructs them that Christians should be known in the city as reliable people who work really hard, not just to make money, but so that they can have resources to provide for themselves and to generously share with people who are in need. After this, Paul addresses a number of questions the Thessalonians had raised about the future hope of Jesus' return. So some Christians in the church had recently died, most likely killed as martyrs, and their friends and family are wondering about their fate when Jesus returns. And so Paul makes it clear that despite their grief and loss, not even death can separate Christians from the love of Jesus. When he returns as king, he will call both the living and the dead to himself. And Paul uses a really cool image here. He uses language that would normally describe how a city subject to the Roman Caesar would send out a delegation to welcome or meet his arrival. Paul then applies this imagery to the arrival of King Jesus. He too will be greeted by a delegation of his people who will go to meet the Lord in the air as they welcome and escort him back to this world where he'll establish his kingdom of justice and peace. Paul then wants the Thessalonians to see how this hope should motivate faithfulness to Jesus. So he pokes fun at the famous Roman propaganda that it's Caesar who brings peace and security. Of course, Rome's peace came through violence, through enslaving their enemies and military occupation. And Paul warns that Jesus will return as king one day and confront this kind of injustice. Followers of King Jesus should live in the present as if that future day is already here. Despite the nighttime of human evil around them, they should stay sober and awake as the light of God's kingdom dawns here on earth as it is in heaven. Paul closes all of these exhortations like he began with a hopeful prayer, that God would permeate their lives with his holiness, that he would set them apart to be completely devoted and blameless until the return of King Jesus. 1 Thessalonians reminds us that from the very beginning, following Jesus as king has produced a truly countercultural or holy way of life. And this will sometimes generate suspicion and conflict among our neighbors. But the response of Jesus' followers to such hostility should always be love, meeting opposition with grace and generosity. And this way of life, it's motivated by hope in the coming kingdom of Jesus that has already begun in his resurrection from the dead. And so holiness, love, and future hope, that's what 1 Thessalonians is all about.
Praise the Lord, young people. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. I am Sister Cedra, and tonight I am coming to you to bring to you the memory verse portion of the lesson. And But first, let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I come before you thanking you, Lord, once again for another night to bring forth your word to young people. We pray that the word will bless their hearts and encourage them and strengthen them. And if there's anyone here under the sound of our voice that does not know you, may they come to know Jesus as a result of this class. We thank you for all that you're going to do in Jesus name. Amen. All right. Boys and girls, I thank you so much for tuning in tonight. And tonight I'll be bringing to you our memory for verse. Uh, make sure you have your Bibles. Let's get that ready. The verse will come out of the book of Mark tonight. And Mark is the second book of the New Testament. And it is also the second book of the Gospels. So uh, hopefully you all have that in your Bibles. Let's read that together. Mark chapter 12, verse 30. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. All right, this week's a little long, so we got to do some breaking down of parts and really drilling tonight. So uh, the first part is, of course, that address. Uh, Where the verses are located, that is located in Mark chapter 12, verse 30. Second part, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Third part, and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. Fourth part, this is the first commandment. All right, now let's pick it up just a little bit here. Mark chapter 12, verse 30. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. All right. One more time. Mark chapter 12, verse 30. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. All right, all together, everybody. Mark chapter 12, verse 30. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Amen, amen, young people. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Please remember to practice this verse throughout the week and make sure you turn in your homework tonight and next week. All right. So now uh, what I'd like to do and like for you all to do is to prepare our hearts for the lesson being brought to you by Brother Covian. Mary anoints Jesus. Praise the Lord, boys and girls. This is Brother Covian coming to you again on a Saturday with our message and Our message today is coming from the book of John, uh, chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, and it's Mary anoints Jesus. And I want you to think about something as we go through this message. I want you to think about what it would be to you to give Jesus your very, very best. What is it that you can give Jesus that's your very, very best? I want you to be thinking about that as we go through this lesson, because that today is the point of it. We're going to learn the value of giving Jesus our very, very best. So I hope you enjoy it. Let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you so much thanks for today, Lord. It may be raining, but it's still a beautiful day because it's the day that you have made. So we just thank you for it. We ask that as we look into your word, I ask that you will um, uh, give me much wisdom and hide me behind the cross. I ask that you will forgive me of my sins and give me the right heart and mind to even share your word. So we just thank you for what you're going to do. Thank you for the understanding that you are going to provide as to what you are telling us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So here in this area of scripture, boys and girls, you have Jesus um, visiting three of his very good friends. 
uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He did that often when he came to that area of Bethany. He would visit with his three friends and they had dinner. He would sit with them and just, you know, enjoy time with this family. Um, and that's something that he did often when he came there. And this was uh, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany. Um, and Lazarus, if you remember, he had risen, raised Lazarus from the dead. And um, they were having dinner once again. And Lazarus sat at the table with them while they were having dinner. Verse 2 tells us that. So here in this area of scripture, boys and girls, you have Jesus um, visiting three of his very good friends, uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He did that often when he came to that area of Bethany. He would visit with his three friends and they had dinner. He would sit with them and just, you know, enjoy time with this family. Um, and that's something that he did often when he came there. And this was uh, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany. Um, and Lazarus, if you remember, he had risen, raised Lazarus from the dead. And um, they were having dinner once again. And Lazarus sat at the table with them while they were having dinner. Verse 2 tells us that. Then in verse 3, um, you see that Mary, uh, Mary got up and she went and got some perfume. Okay. And um, it's a very expensive perfume. Okay. She went and grabbed her very expensive perfume and she began to anoint Jesus's feet with her perfume. And you could think at this moment, if you were there, it got really, really quiet. Everyone's looking, wondering what she was doing. But she decided to take her perfume and anoint Jesus' feet with the perfume. Now, she grabbed the perfume and uh, the, the um, odor or the smell of the perfume. It filled the house. It filled the room. And again, remember, we're talking about a very costly perfume. It was expensive. So it smelled up the house really, really good. Um, it's smelling really nice in there. And Judas is scary. Um, and this is the Judas who would betray Jesus. He, he had a question. He wanted to know, like, why would we let her, you know, or why would she come and Jesus, even more Jesus, why didn't you say anything? Why? Um, so Jesus looks at Mary, he looks at Judas, and he recognizes that these are two very different people. Their mindset and their thought process of what to do for Jesus is two different things. Mary is willing. She, she wants to give Jesus her best, while Judas, who also walked with, with, with Jesus, you know, we knew we know what he did, and he didn't care about that. He didn't care about giving Jesus his very best. But I want to read something to you. It says, Jesus said to Judas, leave Mary alone. Stop complaining. Don't be angry because of what she has done. Do we ever get angry about somebody doing something good? Why would we do she that? She didn't waste the perfume. Because, you know, he thought the perfume and her putting on his feet was a waste. Jesus said she didn't waste the perfume. He said, Mary has anointed me for my burial. Knowing what was happening, where things were coming up. He said, soon I will die and be buried. You will no longer have me with you. I will be gone. But there will always be poor people. You can help them anytime. So Mary gave her very best to Jesus. Shouldn't we follow her example or why wouldn't we follow Mary, Mary's example? Boys and girls, young people, let's always put ourselves in the mindset and in the thought press, thought process, especially today of giving Jesus Christ our very best. Why wouldn't we? We should give Jesus Christ our very best because of what he's done for us. We have a chance. We have an opportunity. We have life. We have everything we have because of what Jesus did for us on that cross. We must never, ever forget that. And he deserves our very best. He deserves our best effort. He deserves our best gift. He deserves our time. He deserves our attention. And that's all he wants. He wants us to show him love so that he can use what he shows us to show others how to get to Christ. Now, I want to talk about witnessing for a second. When we witness and we go out and share Christ, that's something that he wants us to do. Did you know that we only speak and talk about what God has done and tell people how to get saved, but he really does all of the work? What he asks for us is to live a life that represents him, giving him our very best. And then he shines through us. And that shining through us allows other people to see how great the Lord has been to us. And then they want to know, what is it that they're doing? What is it that they're experiencing? I want to be like that person who's never mad, never angry, never frustrated, never this, never that. And it comes from the joy of Jesus Christ. So it's very important that we understand to give him our best because he's going to turn around and give us his best, which he's already given us. 
we're saved. We are going to be with him. We live our lives to, um, to honor him. We're going to be with him one day. He's given us salvation if we have accepted it. So therefore, we need to make sure that we continue to give Jesus our very best every day of our lives. Amen. We're going to close in prayer now, just giving thanks and honor and glory to God for his precious word. Again, let's always think about what things we can do to give Jesus our very best. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for this time. We thank you for how much you love us, dear Heavenly Father. We don't even understand the magnitude of how much you love us, dear Heavenly Father. We're not perfect. We make mistakes, but you pick us up every time and you dust us off and you say, my child, I forgive you and you want us to continue pushing forward. So even Lord, for anyone who's, who's listening to this, who may be struggling with their relationship with you, I just ask dear Father God that you would just lift them up, dear Heavenly Father, and get them back on track for you and moving forward. We just love you. We love your word. We thank you for what you've done for us. And we ask that you will help us to continue to grow spiritually. We thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, as we continue, um, I want to talk about something very, very important. Um, we have so much going on in our world right now. And uh, we just uh, had a message of uh, people who are listening to what Jesus has to say, who are sitting at his feet. Um, you know, uh, his disciples, his children, people who know him and people who are getting to know him and hopefully saying yes to Jesus Christ. Um, but what if you haven't said yes to Jesus Christ yet? How do you establish a personal relationship with him? How do you know that when you leave this earth that you're going to go to heaven? Um, there's so many people afraid right now because of this pandemic that we have going on. Um, school has been canceled. Businesses are closed. People are stuck in their houses and uh, everybody's panicking. And uh, some, some people are panicking, not everybody, but some people are panicking because they're like, what's going on? You know, like, what do I do next? And they were afraid. But for the believer, um, these should be exciting times for us because I believe that God has once again slowed everything down so that we can all get our focus back on him. And this is also an opportunity for us to tell people about Jesus and how they can get to know him. So we'll talk about the way to heaven. Okay. Why did God give his son? It's because he loved the world so much. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus, be, Jesus came to the world. The word became flesh. He lived. He died. And he did that for us so that we could be saved. That's why he gave his son. He loved us so much. He didn't want us to die and go to hell. He wanted us to be with him. So then you may ask, well, well why do I need Jesus? What is my need for Jesus? Why do I need him? We need Jesus because we have sinned. I have sinned. Sometimes we sin by getting into fights. So many other things that we do. We disobey our parents. Um, um, our sin brings sadness. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, uh, Romans uh, 3.23 says. That's why we need Jesus, because we have sinned. Sin separates us from the love of God. There's a penalty for sin. If we don't accept Jesus, there's a penalty for sin. Sin must be punished. Read this line right here. Sin must be punished. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's found in Revelation 20.15. And it says again, for the wages of sin is death, but, and thank God for this word, but right here, B-U-T, but <laughs> the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Romans 6, 23 is where that scripture is found. Okay. So what did Jesus do for you? What did Jesus do for me? He was punished in my place. He was punished in your place. Okay. He is not still dead. He is alive and he's in heaven. He took the punishment for our sins. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 4, pardoned for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Okay? So what do I need to do? How do I accept this gift? How do I become a member of God's family? How does my name get written in the Lamb's Book of Life? How do I know that when he returns, I will be with him? Okay, for again, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He gives us a gift. 
the gift of God is to receive Jesus Christ, to accept salvation from Jesus Christ. That is how we establish it. That's how that is how we establish a relationship with Jesus Christ. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. That is found in John chapter 1, verse 12. Okay? So we must receive God's gift. Do you want to receive God's gift today? Do you want to receive his gift? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, says Romans 10, 13. So there's a prayer that we need to pray if we want to be in the family of God. It's a very simple prayer that if we pray it and we mean it, we immediately be born into the family of God. And that prayer reads, and if you want to just pray it right now, you can bow your head, close your eyes right where you are, and just say this prayer right along with me. You can say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for my sins. I believe that you died on the cross to pay for my sins and rose from the dead. Please come into my heart today. Come into my heart and life and save me. Help me to live for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, what you need to do now is uh, reach out to... You have just been born into the family of God, first of all. And now what you need to do is reach out to um, you know, your, your spiritual leaders here at the Abundant Life Bible Mission, uh, the leadership in this group. Um, you, know, you can reach out now and we'll tell you how to become a disciple, how to build that relationship with Jesus Christ and continue to grow in his faith and grow in his love. And next thing you know, you'll be telling your friends about Jesus. You'll be telling other people how they can be saved and how they can have a relationship with God. And that is the most important thing, especially during these times right now. We don't know when the Lord is going to return, but a lot of biblical prophecy is being fulfilled right now with everything that's going on. It is being fulfilled and the Lord is coming back soon to take us where? To take us to heaven. So what you just learned was how to get there. And the way to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for again for this time. Thank you for this class. Thank you for this message. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the opportunity to still um, get online and share with the children. We ask that you to keep them engaged, keep them focused, help them to build upon what you've started teaching them, help them to draw closer and closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen.